Um, my name is Benjamin Bratton. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I teach here at, in the theory, teach theory here uh, at SciArc. And it's my pleasure to introduce Manuel uh, DeLanda uh, to SciArc today. Um, the, the task of introducing Manuel, I think, is probably a, a rather difficult one in that his work really asks us to hold several things in mind uh, all, all at once and to admire them, I think, not in terms of their consistency, but rather, I would say, in terms of their interdependent uh, antagonisms. Looking through, uh, looking through his writings where um, we, we touch artificial intelligence, the morphogenesis of lava, the referentiality of money, Grunel Island in Scotland where the British tested an anthrax bomb, still uninhabitable, the morphogenesis of sandstone, computer-aided design, mafia, subatomic physics. But in, in organizing all of these together, Manuel's position, the one he asked us to, to imagine, is one quite the opposite of an abstraction, but rather a kind of re relentlessly material position from which we can imagine and, and, and in fact survey oscillations between the discursive and the non-discursive and locate the possibility for the formation or even disciplining of those, those translations um, as the possibility of their governance. So in a way it's really, I think, about a kind of conceptual state transformations. As water might go through a state transformation to ice and then into steam, concepts in Manuel's work also go through these kinds of state transformations. Radio signals into legal signification, Turing machines transforming into uni a universal zoology and back again, cellular automata into membranes of shelter and urban interfaces and back again, and cryptology into genetics and back again. About 10 years ago, um, another Deleuzian um, of different, uh, perhaps a different species, Brian Masumi, suggested that what the contemporary position of architecture was one in which, quote, approach topologically, the architect's raw material is no longer about form, but rather of deformation, of deforming form. No longer figure into void, but, for example, Maya working with systemic primi primitives and programmed functional deformations that sh subtract shape from form, resulting in an extant affect. In an earlier work of Manuel's, written around, um, much earlier, policing the spectrum, he writes, the story of the birth of the computer is the story of how under wartime pressure, what used to be relations between concepts became embodied in physical relations between switches and electromagnetic devices. I would argue in a way that our current situation is one in which this conversion is re reversed, in which the machine structures of computation have in fact become embodied in the concepts by which we, by which we devise and develop an architecture. Lastly, uh, not many people know. I think that uh, Manuel's first um, first practice was uh, as a film was as a filmmaker uh, in the in, in the 70s and produced several um, films. Only a couple of which I've had the opportunity to see with um, great names like um, Incontinence, Raw Nerves, uh, Song of a Bitch, Shit, good stuff. And I think the last conversion I'd like to sort of, uh, you know, I hope we hear a little bit about is the conversion between a kind of cinematic temporality of form, that is the way in which the forms that, that um, architecture uh, brings to us, and the formal temporality of cinema, in fact, become the, the operant conversion in which we work. Which suggests to us, I think, perhaps not so much a design intelligence as perhaps a, a discourse about a design cognition. Having watched hours, weeks, months of, of, of films, the micro techniques of producing the sensations of horror into elegance, of elegance into horror, yeah. have imprinted themselves as visual, visual temporal cues on our design retina. It's like a kind of processing behavior, like the subconscious cycling through the raw data of everyday life, input streams during dream state, cutting and pasting, iterating towards provisional renders in the mind's eye. The act of design, settling into the liminal consciousness of concentration is similar. Design itself is a kind of dream state and therefore a kind of cinema played out on the camera's obscura of our glowing monitors.
Manuel Deland is the author of War in the Age of Intelligent Machines, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, and Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy. It's my pleasure to present Manuel Delanda. Hello, everybody. Well, I wanted to give a talk about the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze, which is what I'm going to do. But the basic rule that I always, you know, with which I constrain myself when I give talks about Deleuze is zero jargon. Clarity is the new black. This whole hippie style, which is very delirious and very psychedelic, and it worked for him very good in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Jesus Christ, that was 30 years ago. We need a new way of talking about the list, new way of understanding what he's talking about. He really was a master. He really invented a complete new worldview. The problem is that the style, which at least superficially resembles the style of many of his contemporaries, has made, it particularly, has made him, particularly in the eyes of scientists and engineers, one more postmodern philosopher. And nothing could be farther from the truth. The most important distinction we can make here is between, I mean, when we compare Deleuze to Baudrillard, Kristeva, Derrida, and so on, is what, what we might call their ontological commitments, which is the most basic layer of philosophy, almost like the operating system of philosophy. And it basically ref refers to the kinds of entities you're committing, you're committing yourself to assert exist in the world. The, the kinds of entities that populate your worldview. Most of the postmodern French philosophers of the 60s believed either that we construct the world with our minds, by, you know, this is like the kind of neo-Kantian theory of perception, by projecting signifiers, by cutting out the world and giving entities, identity, and, and boundaries with words, which of course means that everybody, every culture at least, lives in its own little world, since every culture has a different language. Or, in a more phenomenological vein, they might think that subject and object constitute each other in some kind of seamless web, or a dialectical maneuver that, that uh, constitutes them both. In both cases, you're denying materiality. In both cases, you're denying the world of matter and energy, its own morphogenetic powers. In both cases, you're saying matter and energy need humans to come in, subjects to come in, and whether with language or in a, in a, in, in a, in a different way, give form to this matter, which by itself is formless, sort of a, an inert receptacle for forms that come from the outside. Traditionally, this view, the view that ideas in the mind give form and boundaries and identity to objects in the world, is called idealism. Kant was an idealist, Hegel was an idealist, all phenomenologists in the 20th century were idealists, most semioticians are idealists. The opposite of that is to say the world exists independently of our minds. That is called realism. The problem with realism is that, for one thing, it became a dirty word in the 20th century. To admit in a philosophical you know, in a lecture that you're a realist was like saying, I'm a child molester. Nobody would admit to being a realist. It went so out of fashion that only a few materialists in the Marxist tradition of dialectical and historical materialism kind of stuck to their guns. But the majority of people thought that idealism was the new thing, that it was naive to believe that the world exists independently of our minds. In addition to that, all forms of realism committed the mistake or made the mistake of saying, well, if things are going to exist, if we're going to assert that things exist independently of our minds, then there's got to be something that 
gives those mind independent things their own identity, something that establishes their identity and something that maintains that identity. And that something, in most cases, for most realists, was essences. If I see a bunch of zebras out there, and I say those zebras exist independently of my mind, those zebras exist independently of the signifier zebra, it is because they all share an essence of zebrahood. Which is, of course, ridiculous. The problem was that realists didn't seem to be able to come up with a different strategy. A strategy that would both maintain the mind independence of the world, a certain respect for the materiality of things, a certain respect for the morphogenetic power of materiality, uh, while at the same time coming up with a different way of guaranteeing the identity and stability and boundaries of those things. This matters for design because if you're an idealist, you're going to tend to believe in form, in the genesis of form as a purely cerebral thing, and then look at materials as if they were inert receptacles for the imposition of your forms. If you are a realist of the morphogenetic type, and I'm going to explain right now what are the foundations of that, you tend to then, you tend instead to establish a kind of partnership with, ma with matter. You trust matter. You believe that matter can do things on its own. At the same time, you want to have a say in the final form that is produced. You just don't want matter to impose its own forms on you. So you need to meet matter and energy halfway. You need to make him your partner. The best example I can come up with, and it's an example that I always use, is Fry Otto, the famous 1968 Munich Olympic tent-like roofs that he designed, in which it, it, partly thanks to the fact that computers and finite element analysis and the you know, computers were already there, but the software was a little bit behind the time in the late 60s, he had to recruit something else to do the computing. Remember that those were quite elaborate surfaces with two curves, hyperbolic paraboloids, saddle saddle-shaped uh, 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 surfaces with a double curve, which are belong to the differ differential geometry, so they are not really that easy to, ma to conceive mathematically. So without computers, it is very hard to approach that unless you trust materiality, as Fry Otto did. Fry Otto realized that soap film, which is a very humble, very it, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a type of matter that we encounter in our, in our lives every day, had morphogenetic power. In particular, and it's the simplest of all morphogenetic powers, but he realized that a population of molecules in, in, in soap film tends to minimize surface tension. In other words, all the molecules in that population become attracted to a minimum of surface tension, a singularity in the distribution of energy. And that, that is the reason why so bubbles emerge always with a spherical form when they are not properly constrained, because of course a, a sphere is the shape that minimizes surface tension. So the idea there is you have a population of molecules that because it's being attracted to the singularity can perform morphogenetic morphogenetic magic can create spheres. On the other hand, if you just let soap be, do its whatever it's going to do, it's going to repeat the same form over and over. Spheres. That's not what he wanted. He wanted hyperbolic paraboloids. So he constrained the soap. He met soap halfway. He stuck, you know, in a flat piece of plywood with some wooden sticks to represent the columns or to stand for the columns that would be holding that uh, tent-like roof uh, in place and with kind of hanging pieces of thread attached to those wooden sticks to act as constraints on, on, the, on, on the soap film. He submerged that into a soapy solution, carefully lifted it past the surface, and the soap magically 
had computed a hyperbolic paraboloid. Why? Because a hyperbolic paraboloid in those constrained conditions is the surface that minimizes surface tension. Now that to me is amazing. Using soap to compute. That is, to me, is a much more resourceful act than using nerves to compute. Because nerves, even though they can do the exact same thing and much easier, less messy, the mathematics are hidden from you. You don't know the mathematics of nerves. You just know that they are nice. They are better than polygons. They are supple. You can manipulate them in different ways. But they don't, they don't open up a view of materiality the way soap film does. Because in this case, he proved conclusively the soap film, among other substances, compute in an analog way, not in a digital way, but compute. Because the only way you can get those elaborate hyperbolic paraboloids is through some kind of computation. Of course, it's not exactly a computation, but then again, most analog computers do not exactly compute in the sense of running an algorithm eh, the way in which we are now accustomed to in the, with digital computers. The main point of this that little anecdote is this. Fry Otto met materiality halfway. He made materiality into a partner. Instead of looking at it, as I said, as an inert receptacle for forms that come from the outside. The problem with that, of course, is that that is creationism. You know, in creationism, you have a god who has concepts and signifiers in his head and who wants things to happen and a materiality that's inert. And then you impose a certain amount of form on that materiality by giving it commands, by commanding it to, uh, to adopt a certain form. Let there be light. As if matter by itself could not emit electromagnetic radiation. As if it was beyond the powers of materiality to radiate. And of course, every one of the seven days you have to, you know, go over because, of course, materiality beyond that is not going to be able to do it by itself. It's a, it is a very old tradition. Whether the essences are in the head of God or the essences are platonic essences like sphericity, inhabiting some kind of separate transcendental realm and then informing these inert receptacles by coming and actualizing themselves in this, in this matter. All forms of realism prior to Deleuze, and, and, and I'm exaggerating a little bit here because of course Deleuze himself bases his ideas on other materialists such as Spinoza, such as Nietzsche, such as Bergson, Leibniz, so I'm exaggerating a little bit. There is, in fact, if we are going to believe the list, a long tradition of materialists whose work was always on the losing side relative to idealism. But Deleuze is the, is the one in the 20th century, at any rate, that establishes the basis for a new materialism. Let's call it neo-materialism. And the idea is to give up essences and instead account for the identity and the boundaries of mind independent objects and things via a process, a morphogenetic process. I just roughly spelled with the example of with Fryotto roughly spelled that what goes into it. I'm going to spell it out in much more detail in a second. But it involves trusting that form can emerge spontaneously, that there's certain spontaneity in morphogenesis in nature, but that you can also constrain it and guide it in different ways so that you are part a participant in the process of morphogenesis. But at the very, uh, the, what, the one thing that it definitely implies is to give up the idea that subject and object constitute one another, which of course leaves you clueless as to what happened when there were no humans in this planet. We know there were vibrant ecosystems in this planet before humans. There was all kinds of biological evolution and, and, and morphogenesis of, of, of biological design before humans came into this planet. There was, certainly was cosmological evolution before uh, humans came into this planet. And so idealists just simply decide to ignore that. They decide to start history with 
the first civilizations in Egypt and Babylon with the origin of writing, with the beginning of language as we know it. They might push it back a little bit, but you cannot push the origin of language much more than 60,000 years. So basically they are provincial in terms of time. They inhabit a tiny little slice of time in which humans happen to be the center of the universe. And then we, with our minds, create objects or we create one another. The list breaks with that. The problem again, since, as I said at the beginning, is the style. The style gets in the way because it just it looks so much like the style that idealists use that most people, particularly most people in cultural studies departments, in, in, liter in literary studies and, and other parts of the humanities, see the superficial analogy between Deleuze and the rest of the others and think that Deleuze is one of them. Hence the type of writing that I've engaged in for about 10 or 12 years now, which is one in which I try to reconstruct Deleuze in perfectly clear terms, try to expand Deleuze's insights into science in clear terms, and try to, try to kind of rescue Deleuze from that trap. So what I'm going to try to do today is, I, you know, Deleuze is an extremely elaborate thinker. He had many, many different problems that he was uh, er, kind of erotically aroused by from morphogenesis and science on one hand to cinema on the other. He wrote a lot about literature. He tried to bring a new concept of how to analyze, for instance, Kafka or Proust that was not about signifiers. Perhaps I should say something about that before I get started with the science part. Today I'm just going to tackle the science part. That is the, the part I think it can make most sense for you guys and the part that I think can contribute more in, to ideas about design uh, as a process and as a partnership with matter. But let me just say one thing about his he, the way he approaches the inevitable, which is meanings. Uh, to say that signifiers, or whatever linguistic theory you prefer, are not as important as the 20th century made us believe it was, doesn't mean to, it's not to imply that language is not important. Language is clearly important. It's not to imply that meanings are not important. They are clearly important. We're using them right now to communicate. The problem is that and one day, historians in the future are going to laugh at us, well, not at us, but at the, at the last three decades of the 20th century. They're going to laugh because there's an irony here. There are two meanings of the word meaning. And they have, been, they have not been distinguished, they have not been differentiated, and by, by putting them together without seeing what the difference is, we've been thinking that everything that has the word meaning attached to it refers to one thing when in fact there's two entirely different things. On one hand there is signification. When someone asks you what do you mean, they, that person may want a definition of a term that you just used that that person has never used or they may want a disambiguation of a sentence that you just used because Two, uh, a word, two words may have the same meaning or, or one word may have two different meanings and in the context of that sentence it is unclear what exactly you mean. And so that is of course a semantic matter. Definitions, disambiguation of sentences, the disambiguation of the meaning of sentences is clearly a linguistic matter and something about semantics. It's the kind of thing that you engage in hermeneutics and interpretation with. On the other hand, there is signification on one hand, what I just said, and then there is significance, importance, relevance. When someone says, my life has no meaning, you don't mean to say, my life is not in a dictionary, or my life is ambiguous to me. It has nothing to do with linguistics. What you're saying is, I don't feel important. I don't understand in what way am I relevant to what's going on in the world. In what way do I make a difference in this world? Making a difference is something that is entirely non-linguistic. It might apply to language, but it applies to many other things. 
when you're looking, for instance, at a craftsman, a metallurgist, a carpenter, go through a series of operations, some of them make sense to you, and then all of a sudden there's one operation that seems totally ritual, totally ceremonial, that doesn't really seem to make a difference in the material process, you might ask yourself, well, what's the meaning of that particular step there? And by that you don't say, can you please define a word, Mr. Metallurgist? Or you don't know saying, can you disambiguate the sentence? Because the metallurgist is not even talking for God's sake. It's like hammering, quenching, annealing, performing material operations on metals. What you want to say is, is that little dance you did over there before the, in between the quenching and the hammering really relevant? Does it make a difference to the final sword or metallic product that you're going to produce there? Is it significant? Is it important? Is it relevant? In other words, judgments or assessments of relevance can be made about entirely material operations that are performed in silence, that have absolutely no linguistic content whatsoever. <laughs> The problem is, and this, as I said, is I very, very ironic, is that the fact that the word meaning has two meanings has escaped everyone's attention, and one day historians will laugh at it. It will just sound like, can you believe this? The last three decades of the 20th century, people specialized in meanings, and the specialists in meanings didn't realize there were two meanings of the word meaning. Do you people see the irony here, or am I the only one? It's like, this is unbelievable. Deleuze is all about significance, relevance, making a difference. Whether you're making a difference by talking, or whether you make a difference by acting. You can ask about Fry Otto's ensemble of the plywood, the columns, the hanging threads. Did the threads have to be, had to have an overhang? Did they, or were they supposed to be tight? That is a real question about significance. They had to overhang. So they would allow the soap film to expand them, to tense them. If he had done it otherwise, the thing wouldn't have worked. So you can make assessments or judgments of significance about Fry Otto's work that have absolutely nothing to do with hermeneutics. Absolutely nothing to do with interpreting a text. So when Deleuze talks about Kafka, when Deleuze talks about Proust, when Deleuze talks about literature in general, he's making judgments of significance. In fact, among realists, he's among the few who believes that the most important category in philosophy is not truth, but relevance. Truths, as he knows, are a dime a dozen. I have three dollars in my pocket right now. That's true, but who cares? It's just a trivial truth. There are hundreds of millions of trivial truths. Truth is actually not even a problem. It's relevant truth, significant truths, truths that make a difference. Anyway, I say this because I don't, since I want to concentrate on the scientific aspect of the list today, and again, as a way of throwing light on the, let's call it the Fry Otto paradigm, someone may actually get the idea, well, but Deleuze wrote a lot about literature. Deleuze wrote a lot about text. So how, how do you account for that? The fact of the matter is that Deleuze texts about texts are also about a certain materiality. And in fact, his own views on language are very material. He was more interested in the materiality of language, the pressure waves that are coming out of my mouth right now, modulated by my larynx, by my palate, by my teeth, by my lips, by the materiality of my vocal apparatus, that is the sonic matter of language, that he was interested in the semantic content of it. He was much more interested in the materiality of writing inscriptions, of written inscriptions rather, whether in stone, in papyrus, or ones and zeros in the internet, then he was interested in the actual meaning of the words. Again, not that the semantics doesn't matter, it does matter, but it's much, it becomes much more clear what role it plays once you take it out from the, in the center of the world and put it in its place. Language becomes one more creature in a material world. So, having said that, let's see right now what exactly Deleuze takes from science to create his worldview. Remember the problem as I stated at the beginning. 
realist in the past were mostly essentialists. And essentialism assumes an inert matter that receives from, from the outside. We need to replace that with a new realism, a process realism, in which identity and borders or boundaries are objective, mind independent, but entirely historically contingent. There's always a historical process that produced them, and there's always a historical process that maintains them. Those historical processes, we should imagine them with parameters, imagine knobs that can be turned so that boundaries can become fuzzier or sharper in jargon terms, territorialized or deterritorialized. And so something with fuzzy boundaries does not affect his realism. It's simply something that is objectively fuzzy as long as everything is accounted for historically. Before I start, let me just give you one more example. The typical essentialist realist would look at the table of the elements, the chemical table of the elements, and look at hydrogen, helium, you know, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and so on, and say, well, you, you know, I believe that these things exist independently of, our, of my mind. Hydrogen exists independently of my mind. Oxygen exists independently of my mind. The word oxygen and the word hydrogen do not create hydrogen and oxygen. But at that point, you might very easily fall into essentialism if you begin to believe in hydrogen in general or oxygen in general and then try to come up with an essence for it. Hydrogen, for instance, has one proton in its nucleus. Helium, the next element, has two protons in its nucleus. If you take one of the, nucle one of the protons in, out, of, out of the helium atom, it becomes hydrogen. So you go, oh, well, that's its essence. Hydrogen in general can be defined by the essence of possessing only one proton in its nucleus. Helium in general can be defined by possessing two. And the proof that I'm right is that if you take one proton out of that nucleus, out of that uh, helium nucleus, you transform it into hydrogen. That would be the wrong answer because that would be the essentialist answer. What would be the correct answer? Well, you have to give, first of all, you don't believe in hydrogen in general. You simply believe on an extremely large population of hydrogen atoms inhabiting the universe. Not hydrogen in general, but the haxietes, the thisness of this atom, this other atom, this other atom, forming extremely large populations. And then for each one of those atoms, you need to conceive of a process that put it together. A factory, a manufacturing process, in quotes, that actually created those atoms. That an assembly process that put them together. That assembly process is called nucleosynthesis and occurs in stars of different sizes, depending on the size of a star. That's how far into the periodic table of the elements it can go. Our sun produces mostly hydrogen and helium. There might be some, a few production processes of carbon and oxygen and so on, but it's mostly helium and hydrogen. Nucleosynthesis is something that has to happen for each one of those atoms in the population to exist. They have a history. They have a date of birth. They are historical entities. They are not some essence existing in some transcendental, timeless space. I don't want to sound like uh, Lisa Minnelli here, but we are all stardust in the sense that every single atom in our bodies was manufactured in some star or another. Atoms, with the exception of plutonium and transuranics, which are are manufacturing this planet in special laboratories, are not manufacturing this planet. We are made out of stardust. So that is the general recipe. Always look for a historical process of assembly and always look for a historical process of maintenance because one thing is for something to acquire its identity. Another thing is for it to keep its identity. Many hydrogen atoms, for instance, lose electrons and become ions, which is now a different thing. Or they might acquire an extra neutron in this nucleus and become an isotope of hydrogen, like deuterium. In other words, identities can change. And so if something maintains its identity through time, there's got to be something that explains how or why. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
right on the blackboard right now, the three reasoning styles, the three styles, the explanatory, three explanatory styles that Deleuze takes from science. As you will see, each one of these three styles has a different origin and a different branch of science. Science, unfortunately, is a little, not a little, too specialized so that people working in one branch of science do not really communicate with people working in other branches of sciences. This is where realist philosophers come in. We try to create an inter interdisciplinary connection between all those discoveries, all those explanatory styles. And Deleuze, in addition to that, brings a special intuition to develop these this explanatory styles in a more philosophical vein, in a way that goes beyond the strict laboratory necessities of a thermodynamicist or an evolutionary biologist, to, to, to give more philosophical content to these reasoning styles that, that, that guide his thought. Let me write them down very fast. The first one is called, oops, I have, I have backups, backups, population thinking, this reasoning style comes from evolutionary biology, I will explain it in a second, number one. Number two, intensive thinking. It's a reasoning style that comes from thermodynamics. Finally, there is topological thinking or non-metric thinking, which of course comes from mathematics. The three have very clear roots in scientific history, but unless you're an ecologist, ecologists happen to be by necessity interdisciplinary since they need to deal with the flows of matter and energy through food chains, they need to deal with genetic questions of evolution, how predators and prey, for instance, engage in arms races in which they are the selection pressure of each other. And they also have to deal with topology because when you deal with food chains, you're dealing with connectivity. You want to know in a rainforest, for instance, why is there so much more connectivity between the different species than in a temperate forest than, say, in a tundra? And how those differences in connectivity will affect a human, a, if the, the, the footprint that we live, that we live in those, in those uh, e e ecosystems. You know, for instance, how many species can be wiped out before the entire thing collapses? That's topology, because it's dealing with connectivity. So, but unless you're an ecologist, you typically deal with one of those three reasoning styles independently. So the virtue of Deleuze is having brought them together in such a way as to make them much more philosophically fruitful. Let me start, and let me see if I can get a little fatter here. Okay, just a second, just a second. Yeah, this is better. Okay, and it's red. Let's start with population thinking. There's two basic ideas in population thinking. One is the following. Any population of variable replicators coupled to, I'm gonna put this, this plus sign as coupled, any filter, any sorting device, any, any sieve gives rise to a search process. Let me explain this. Gives rise to evolution. But evolution, once you give up the silly idea that the formula for evolution is survival of the fittest, which is one of the silliest formulas ever. It wasn't even Darwin's. It was coined by Herbert Spencer, a very popular philosopher at the end of the 19th century. That has very little to do with the reality of things. The survival of the fittest assumes that the possibility space for the development of a species is, is exactly the same as the soap bubble was for Fry Otto. Something with a single optimum. 
whereas possibility spaces are structured with a single optimum in some cases, so bubbles, crystals, species are, have too many determinants, too many causal factors involved to have a single optimum, and so there's no such thing as the fittest. What this little formula says basically is this. All of the terms are important. Number one, you don't, cannot have evolution if you start with Adam and Eve, period. Evolution occurs in reproductive communities that have to have a minimum size. When we drive a species to extinction, as we do just about every day, it's not because we hunt every organism, okay, I'll kill you one by one until the very last one, yes, you've got, you know. It's because we reduce their habitats in, or affect their habitats in such a way that the reproductive community becomes smaller than the minimum size. There's a minimum called the nucleation threshold below which the community cannot be genetically effective. You need a certain space for those mutations that occur at random and for those sexual recombinations that also occur with a little element of randomness in the, in the actual point at which the chromosomes get caught and, and glued. For it to work, you cannot have it with Adam and Eve. So that's populations are basic here, but then they are basic on everything. I just explained to you the population of hydrogen atoms idea with which to replace hydrogen in general. For a process realist, populations, swarms, collectivities are basic. Of variable replicators. Notice that the word genes don't appear there. Doesn't appear there. It's replicator. Because although genes are replicators, they replicate by template assisted repl re replication. Anything that replicates can fit in there. You probably have heard of the word meme, a word that used to have value before it became overextended. Memes originally referred to patterns of behavior transmitted by imitation. The perfect example and the most studied one is, song, is, bir is, like, is bird songs. By, by which I mean, you know, like the nightingale, like the blackbird, not like bird chirpings. Bird songs are quite elaborate. And if you place a, a, a bird from those species in a, in a black box when it's a little baby and do not allow it to hear the, the mature adult song, that little bird is not going to be able to sing the song of its species. It, it genetically only has a few of the notes, kind of like the, like the basic structure, but the flourishes and everything else that is needed in order to seduce the female to come to your territory are not there meaning birds have to hear the song. Therefore, they learn to sing. Therefore, it's not in the genes. Nevertheless, because they pass it from one generation to the next, birth songs are replicators. They're called memes. The only problem with the word meme is, of course, that people got carried away and they began to think that everything that's not genes is memes. And that automatically limited the use of the word. There's websites today called memology or memetics, I'm sorry, like genetics, and they try to use memes as if everything in culture, it was sort of, sort of, as if they were kind of general cultural atoms. We have to be very careful here because, of course, we need to always specify the mechanism of replication. Imitation of all the patterns of behavior, of observed patterns or heard patterns of behavior, such as singing, is one mechanism, but that's not a universal mechanism. The phonemes of English, the words of English, the grammatical patterns of English are not transmitted by imitation. The baby, uh, when he's six months or, you know, very, very young, will probably try to imitate the songs by the adult, produced by adults. But by the time that baby is two years old, he or she knows that it's an obligation to learn language and to learn the language of your community. If you're born in a dialect-speaking community, you have to learn that dialect. If you, you're born in a, particular, in a community that, that speaks a standard, you have to learn that standard. Standards are not something that exists in the animal world. So linguistic replicators replicate through an entirely different mechanism, which is enforced social obligation. By the time you're three years old, you haven't got this, you end up in special ed. 
If you still don't get it, you end up in the madhouse. That doesn't happen to birds that I know. So we need to just be very clear what replicator, what the mechanism of replication is so that we don't start creating false categories here. But the point, the basic point being that many things replicate and replicate through different mechanisms. And as long as there's a population of those replicators, it fits this formula. Then comes a key word here, variable. No variability, no heterogeneity, no difference, no evolution. If selection pressures have homogenized the gene pool of a species to the extent that every single member of that species has basically the same genes, evolution stops right there. Difference drives evolution. Whether it's accidental differences in the case of mutation, or is the differences that come from combining two genomes from two members of a species that may be far away geographically from the same ecosystem or from different ecosystems, as in sexual recombination, difference has to be constantly produced in order for evolution to proceed. Difference is the fuel of evolution. So that's the first line there. The second line says that any filter can do the job of natural selection. Natural selection itself is a filter. It's a sieve. It doesn't do anything more than let certain of the, of the genes pass more copies of themselves to the next generation and let other genes pass less copies of themselves to the next generation. And it's by biasing the replication process in one direction or another that it can do its job. But any filter would do. Just think about those crazy psycho animal breeders that create chihuahua dogs. What? That, that cannot possibly have any survival value, unless of course you're, gonna, you're going to annoy your enemy to death. <laughs> You know, the little things with the, with the flaky little legs and, you know, you throw them in the wild and go, be free, and it ah, gets eaten like in a second, you know. <laughs> Nevertheless, the animal breeder, however perverse, is a filter. He's filtering those genes until you've got less and less hair, smaller and smaller size, more and more obnoxiousness. <laughs> and that's a filter. Any filter will do. It doesn't have to result in adaptation or any, of, any, of any type. Finally, comes the product of those two things, which is basic, I should have written there, evolution. But I wrote search process for the following reason. Today we know that there are genetic algorithms, that is, software that mimics evolution. All you have to do is throw a population of variable programs, or even a population, of, a population of variable strings of ones and zeros. One is called the genetic algorithm, though it calls genetic programming. And as long as you, you deploy a population of these variable replicators, programs or strings of ones and zeros, inside the computer, and you have some, some uh, a mechanical recipe to allow for the mating and the passing of more genes to the following generation and so on, you get a kind of evolutionary process going inside the computer. Genetic algorithms are not new. In fact, they, are, they, they were invented in the 60s. They only acquired their name in the 70s. Genetic programming is a little more novel and it's much more powerful. Both can be applied to architecture in a very fruitful way. But in order to do that, you need to master MEL. At the very least, you cannot be clicking and mousing. You need to be into procedural design, because only when you begin to understand procedural design, as design done by procedures, can you then let those procedures evolve, not to replace you, but to allow you to, as a kind of tool for thought. Let me show you in what sense. Genetic algorithms and genetic programming are classified in computer science as search algorithms. Search algorithms are very important because they can make you extremely rich. Just think of the Google guys. But also because just about every operation in a computer involves searching one thing or another. Searching for a space in your hard disk, searching for a word in your files. So search algorithms are a very specific category of mechanical recipes. When genetic algorithms first came along, they were, they were found to be extremely powerful search algorithms because this entire population that searches a space of possibilities in parallel. 
And so it doesn't get stuck in local optima. Or if one part of the population gets stuck, another part of the population can kind of drive it out and search the entire space. So for artists, genetic algorithms, and more importantly, genetic programming, it's important because you were always confronted with a space of possibilities at the, at the outset of design. We know certain constraints. We know a certain, uh, perhaps, some of the constraints are legal, zoning law. Some of the other constraints are the, the customer, the client. Some of the other constraints might be your own design school or tradition. But the space of possibility is still enormous. And you, do, you want to make sure you search it thoroughly. So genetic algorithms are a, a way of assisting your search. But what this means also is that evolution out there in the world, independently of our minds and independently of our designs, is also a search process. But it's a search process in spaces that are much larger than the design spaces we use. Just think of the space of possible vertebrate designs. It's gigantic. For a certain part of history, the space may be under-searched. Think of, for instance, of the era of the dinosaurs, in which, of course, the reptilian part of the vertebrate search space was exhaustively searched. There were all kinds of designs. But the mammalian part of the space was under-searched. There were only a few mammal species, all of them looking kind of rat-like, hairy, with like cross eyes and like really ugly. If a Martian would have come to Earth at that point, he would have said, whoa, mammals really have no future in this planet. And look at, look at that ugly little thing. Huh? Look at the reptilians, the T-Rex, and the, the Velociraptor. My god, that's where everything is going. Little did he know, this Martian hypothetical zoologist, that in that genome of that little rat-like creature, there were rhinoceros, elephants, giraffes, humans, chimpanzees, bats, dolphins, whales, and yes, chihuahua dogs. It was almost impossible to see how undifferentiated, how infolded, how implicit all those designs were in that genome, and how, by a lucky accident, a meteorite that, that opens up all these niches by destroying a bunch of dinosaurs, all of a sudden that genome can begin differentiating, expressing itself, filling out all those niches with the most fantastic variety of designs. So one of the challenges, and I'm going to get to that in a second when we talk about topological thinking that face uh, uh, users of genetic algorithms today, is of course to design the space of possibilities. Gen the genetic algorithm is, do the is going to do the search for you, but if the space itself is not filled with these possibilities, if, if it's not something like the space of mammalian designs, then you are going to run out of forms relatively fast. So this is the first part of population thinking. As you can see, it's, 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 it's philosophically pregnant. Every word has significance. The second part, which is also very important, because this is what's going to give us the historical aspect of it, is this. Speciation. equals reproductive isolation. The birth of a new species is a historical event. There is no such thing as zebrahood. Zebras, just like they are here, they could not have been here. Humans, just like they are here, they could not have been here. Every species is contingent, contingent historically. Just like it's here, it could have not been here. It doesn't mean that it's arbitrary or that it is unimportant. On the contrary. Reproductive isolation basically means that a particular reproductive community has ceased to be able to mate and recombine genetic materials with another, another part of that reproductive community. Imagine a river changing course and beginning to run uh, and, and running round now uh, through the middle of two of what used to be one reproductive community but that now it gets split into two now each one of those two halves is is now able to accumulate genetic changes on its own and they may get to the point where they cannot mate with one another anymore at that point 
we can talk of the birth of a new species. Speaking of birth here is very important because, of course, births are historical. Well, so, uh, so is death, extinction. Species are both speciated and then go extinct. Have a birth, a date of birth, whether you can mark it in the calendar or not with any precision, and they have a definite moment of their death. Speci isolation comes in degrees. You may be completely unable to either mechanically mate or combine your genes with another species. That would be the strongest value. It could be also intermediate, such as in the case of horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys can do it, and they can have offspring, but the offspring is typically sterile. They are mules. Therefore, the genetic flow doesn't go through them anymore. Genetic uh, reproductive isolation can also be extremely low in value, very deterritorialized, to use a little piece of jargon here. We are very territorialized genetically. We cannot mix our genes with anybody else. But microorganisms are super deterritorialized, and they, in fact, do not form species. They form something that is called a quasi-species, which is basically the wild type surrounded by a cloud of mutants, and is the whole cloud that evolves, called a quasi-species or quasi-species. This is important, again, because not only is reminding us that everything is historical, that isolation occurs at a particular historical time, but it also reminds us that it's contingent. It's a barrier. It's a barrier that is there, but could not be there. And therefore, is subject to transgressions by technology, including biotechnology. Let me give you a little example of this. Uh, upstate New York, as we speak, there's a factory that's producing spider silk. Spider silk is very valuable. You know, spiders produce several kinds of silk, one of which I think is called flagelliform. It's almost as strong as Kevlar. So if, you, if we could just domesticate spiders like silkworms had been domesticated for centuries, we could produce this Kevlar-like material, weave it into, into ropes of, of, of increasing thickness, and create cables of incredible strength. The problem is spiders are predators, and so they do not allow themselves to be domesticated, at least not with the ease with which we domesticated worms. So they had to do something else. What they did is this. They took the spider silk of interest, they analyzed, and they, they, they analyzed it. Chemically, they realized it was just a repeated protein that's just repeated. It's just a chain-like fiber of one protein that's repeated over and over and over again. Proteins, of course, are words written with an alphabet of 20 letters, the 20 amino acids. And each one of those amino acids is connected to the genetic code in which three nucleotides, three of the letters used by DNA, corresponds to every amino acid. So a chain-like entity like our DNA contains a bunch of words made out of an alphabet of four letters which are connected by a frozen code to each one of the amino acids. This is by now routine. You can translate things back and forth using gen the genetic code. So what these people did was they analyzed, they, 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 they isolated the protein, they broke it down into its component letters, its component amino acids, figure out what gene corresponds to each one of those letters, that is what sequence of three letters in gene talk corresponds to what amino acid in protein talk, and created a designer gene. And they took that designer gene, put it into a retrovirus, a special type of virus that when it invades reproductive cells, it can insert its own sequences of DNA into that particular cell, and Yes, place that designer gene inside a goat. Now, at first, I thought the result was going to be spider goat. You know, a goat with a superhero uniform, shooting off silk like, bah, bah. Uh, but no, unfortunately, it was not as amazing as that. Nevertheless, they have bio, they have bio, uh, 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 Biotechnology produced goats in upstate New York. They have a farm now in which those genes are part of the genome of those goats. The goats express the gene, but their metabolism doesn't know what to do with it, so it excretes it in the milk. They milk the goats, they take the lactose and all the other milky parts out, they end up with a paste, which then extru they extrude through a screen that has a tiny little hole, and out the other side comes 
Yes, a spider silk. It's amazing, but at the same time, it's scary. Because spiders and goats have not mate together for a long time. They are separated evolutionarily by I don't know how many millennia. And so you cannot be fooling around with those things, people. The proper, that goes to show you that the barrier, the reproductive isolation, was contingent. It's a barrier, and it's there, but you can go over it or tunnel through it, which again shows its historicity. And that's the main point of the example. Let me move on. Remember that one of the most important words here was difference. No difference, no evolution. The word difference is going to enter into the second form of thinking, called intensive thinking, which comes from thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, you are a, it's usual to distinguish between two types of properties of things. It's extensive properties, the extensive properties of an object or of a process, and the intensive properties of an object or a process. You guys, as architects, are very familiar with extensive properties. Examples of extensive properties are length, volume, area. It also includes amount of entropy, amount of energy, any quantity or property that can be divided in space in a straightforward way. If I have a one meter ruler, one meter long ruler, and I cut it in two halves, I end up with two half meter long rulers. You guys, of course, are very, these are very important properties for you because, of course, you always get a particular volume of space in which to build, and you must subdivide that space in some kind of functional way, and you create blueprints in which the lengths are in proportion, and you're assuming the engineer will understand that and blow up the blueprint respecting the proportions, and so all that is extensive. In addition to that, there are other properties called intensive. Temperature, pressure, volume, uh, I'm sorry, temperature, pressure, speed, density, and most important for you guys, stress. The stresses or the loads that a particular load-bearing structure that you build is sustaining. Those are properties that cannot be divided. You take a gallon of water at 90 degrees temperature and you divide it into two, you do end up with two half gallons, but not two half gallons at 45 degrees of temperature. You end up with two half gallons at the original temperature, 90 degrees. They, intensive differences do not allow themselves to be divided. You can superimpose a grid on them and divide them into degrees, for instance, Fahrenheit or Celsius, but that is a superimposition. The, 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 the intensive property itself is not being divided. That is the textbook definition, and here's where Deleuze comes in and shines. Because if you read a textbook of thermodynamics, that's it. That's, that's the end of the explanation. Once the, w w certain types of properties are divisible, the other ones are not subdivisible. But Deleuze says, let's think a little bit more about this. There's more to it than just that. Number one, intensive differences are productive. And here, notice here the second appearance of the word difference. Let me just put it this way, drive processes. Are productive. They contain free energy that can be used as fuel for processes. The most obvious example is, of course, a box, sealed box with a sealed, it, it divided in two chambers, one with hot air, the other one with cold air. That is an intensive difference. You open a little window in, in that in internal division, and the cold air will, I mean, the hot air will, will flow spontaneously to the other side, and you can tap the energy in that spontaneous flow to run, say, an electric generator. The steam engine, for instance, was, of course, based on intensive differences. You had a hot boiler, which was kept hot by somebody shoveling coal in it. You have a cold reservoir, which in most cases could just be the earth itself. And the larger you can make those differences, the more power you can extract from them. 
in turn through pressure differences inside the piston chambers and volume differences as the steam became vapor and so on. I mean, the steam became liquid and vice versa. But the most important thing is that intensive differences are fuel. Here is one way, one image that I would, that, that I always find very useful to illustrate this. Let's draw, and when I say draw, I mean scribble, two maps of the Earth, an extensive map and an intensive map. Since I don't know how to draw, I'm just going to draw kind of a portion of the country that I come from, the only one that I really know how to draw, Mexico, yeah. That's Florida, the East Coast, and the rest is just Central America and a bunch of other countries, who cares? <laughs> Some islands here. That's an extensive map of the Earth. It's all about the areas covered by particular a continents, the lengths of the coastlines, they are intrinsic. Those divisions are frontiers, territories. Territorialization is very linked to extensive properties. There is, on the other hand, a completely different map of the Earth, which is an intensive map. A high of pressure here, a low of pressure, a cold front, I mean a warm front, a cold front moving here, and another one animated. A mass of air moving with certain speed, another mass of air with a, with a, with a different speed. As you can see, it's a completely different type of map. It's an intensive map. It's a map made out of productive differences that are in motion with respect to one another. You can, unlike this one, you can hardly ever present a map like this without some kind of animation. But the most important thing is the fact that it's made out of entirely out of mobile, intensive differences. And those differences is what, is what produced the architecture of thunderstorms, the architecture of hurricanes and tornadoes, and all the other creatures that inhabit the copal system hydrosphere atmosphere. An incredibly vibrant place, constantly changing, constantly morphogenetically active, see, eh, 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 giving birth to, to crazy entities continuously, entities that derive their sustenance derive their energy from those intensive differences. This is what Deleuze calls a body without organs. I bet you didn't see that coming. That's one of the most mysterious words in the Deleuzean vocabulary. Everybody thought it had something to do with junkies or something. Not with something as palpable and, and as concrete as this. It's a body, because it's a body of water and air that's bounded, floating in the middle of space. And it has the same kind of morphogenetic power as a developing embryo, or even as a metabolism, which is also based on differences. Our brains process through differences in intensity, differences in charge between sodium and potassium atoms inside or outside the membranes of neurons. Everything in our bodies is a matter of gradients, chemical gradients, acid, base, uh, uh, redox, which means, means uh, uh, reduction and oxidation different capacities that drive flows of electrons, or in the case of acid base, pH, drives flows of protons. And it's those flows driven by chemical gradients or by chemical intensive differences that animate us. But they, they are right there, only without the organs. This thing doesn't need to have a stomach, a liver, a heart, a brain, in order to have the same kind of life, the same kind of non-organic life that we have. And so I would like you to keep in mind this every time that you use the word body without organs so that we all know what we're talking about and so that it becomes clear that it is not one of those crazy postmodern terms that is supposed to, you know, be uh, subjected to endless rounds of hermeneutics to investigate what was the meaning of the meaning of the meaning of the meaning that the Luz really had in mind. It's a very simple, straightforward definition. It's at the basis of thermodynamic driven processes throughout the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and so on. The second, oh, now let me just say one more thing. 
Of course, when you, whenever you have an extensive map, all you have to do is scratch a little and you will find the intensive processes that produce that extensive map. Just dig a little bit under the lithosphere here and eventually you're going to get to the mantle and you're going to find lavas self-organized into convection cells, that is circulatory patterns, and also those self-organized lavas are also being driven by intensive differences between the super hot and charged electrically core molten iron and other metals at the center of the earth and the relatively cooler temperatures on top and it is thanks to those conveyor belts that the continental plates can move and that we can have plate tectonics as everybody knows the himalayas the rocky mountains are merely folds Falls in the lithosphere produced by the clash of the continents that drive on different continental plates. In other words, what has formed extensive, what has produced extensive, is intensive differences and processes underneath it. So intensive thinking, therefore, is all about process. It's all about asking yourself what is the energy budget for that process, asking yourself in what's in a, a, a what drives a process, and uh, that is one of the aspects of intensive thinking. Let me now get myself a little bit more blackboard here. To write down the second condition. Intensive thresholds. This again are two things that any thermodynamicist would acknowledge, but that they are not, they do not make it into the textbooks. You need it at the to, 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 to kind of capture the, the, the pregnancy of these terms, of these concepts, and unfold it philosophically to, to, until it, it, it reaches fruition. Intensive thresholds basically refer to any kind of phase transitions, such as a transition between solid and, uh, solid and liquid, liquid and gas. Those always occur at specific critical points of intensity. Whether they're the points of, inten uh, of t uh, critical points of temperature, critical points of pressure, critical points of speed, critical points of density. That's the only kind of division that intensive properties allow. A division in which what's divided changes nature. Or if you want to, a division in which quantitative changes become qualitative changes. So very important for morphogenesis, of course, because that is when new forms may emerge. The history of the universe is, in a sense, the history of how gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces differentiated after the Big Bang after a succession of phase transitions. That is, as the, that big ball of plasma began cooling down, traversed this, crossed this thresholds of intensity, and began differentiating itself. But you can find those intensive thresholds in many other areas of reality. There is a sequence, for instance, of regimes of flow between laminar or uniform flow at a certain below a certain threshold of speed, then convective or periodic flow past that threshold, then another threshold which begins with the, at which turbulence starts. These are different forms of flowing for any kind of liquid, and most liquids, and indeed most flows, such as electrical flows, display this kind of change in behavior or change in architecture, if you wish, at a particular point or a particular a, a threshold of an intensive quantity. Think also of, for instance, gates in animals and, 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 and humans. Gates are, of course, just manners of moving, manners of engaging your bones and your muscles, your bones carrying loads in compression, your muscles carrying loads in tension. But at a certain particular point in speed, you change from one gate, say walking, to another gate, like trotting. You can do this by putting a horse, for instance, on a thread mill that you can, in which you can change the speed of the thread mill to adjust it uh, lower or you know, faster or slower. You put the horse in, and the horse, just in order to keep himself in place, 
you know, you can start like fooling around with the horse by like changing the knob, you know. You can imagine it's like Mr. Ed and it's going, Wilbur, what's happening here? You can prove that at a particular point in speed, the horse is, the horse is forced to change from walking to trotting and engages different muscles of the back, the, I mean muscles that were not involved in walking, and now begins to trot at that relatively faster speed, then you keep increasing the speed again, and now the horse has to gallop in order to keep himself in the same place in that thread mill. Gates, and the critical points of speed at which they change, are also phase transitions. There are many other examples of these intensive sequences, for instance, insulator, conductor, superconductor. You know, the, your properties of how you, 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 the electrons can move through you change at different points that are also very specific. So these two components of intensive thinking where is, are there in the textbook, but they are lost in the textbook. You needed a philosopher to bring it up, to bring them up. And of course a philosopher whose philosophy is a philosophy of difference who would be very who would immediately catch the importance of the fact that it is differences that are driving the process. Second time we find this word here. No genetic differences, no evolution. No intensive differences, no motion, no process. Differences rule. Finally, topological thinking, which as you will see also involves difference because before topology came differential geometry. Differential geometry was born in the 19th century. It was created by two guys, Gauss and Riemann. Who asked themselves, well, why do we have to think always in Euclidean metric terms? The difference between the metric and the non-metric is similar to that between intensive and extensive. Metric is, of course, Euclidean geometry, but it, but it can also be curved metric geometries, like curve one way or curve the other. The moment you move to projective geometry, differential geometry, topology, you're already dealing with non-metric geometries. In a metric geometry, the concepts of length, area, and volume are basic, because they remain invariant regardless of how you rotate, translate, mirror image, or in any way transform the spaces. But already with projective geometry we see that lengths do not remain invariant. When you project something on a screen it becomes larger. If the screen is tilted in a particular way they become distorted. Projective geometry is the geometry of shadows. And shadows do not remain, do, I mean, the lengths, volume, lengths and areas, they don't have any volume, Lengths and areas of shadows do not remain invariant. It depends on the position of the sun. It depends on the projectivity. Beyond that, there is differential geometry. And differential geometry is where differences, again, come in. Remember that differential geometry is based, of course, in the differential calculus. The differential calculus is about rates of change. That is, speeds of becoming. How slow or how rapidly are you changing? Are you becoming different? than you wear. And it's all about taking advantage of differences. Differential geometry is actually, I mean, differential, the differential calculus, the calculus, is actually quite magical. Both differentiation and integration are quite magical operators, quite different from multiplication and division and exponentiation and, 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 and square roots and so on, because they deal with change. And they deal with change and, and with the limits at which these changes can be taken. Not to get too technical about it, let me show you the basic idea that Gauss invented. I'm going to use a two-dimensional shape and I'm going to do it as a folded thing because folds are something that cannot be handled very well by metric geometries. It's a two-dimensional shape. And in, before Gauss, the way in which you analyze that, and we still do that in the computer, is we inscribed that two-dimensional shape in a, in a space with one extra dimension. I just drew it as a set of Cartesian coordinates, which, are, which serve as a frame of reference for you to study the surface or the space 
Every point in the space, of course, the mathematical the space is simply a set of points and a definition of what constitutes a neighborhood, of a definition of nearbyness or proximity. Every point in this space can then be traced to its to where the point where they the, the length, the rigid lengths, uh, uh, how far away they are from the coordinates, and you can give it an x, y, and z address. We still do that in CAD and in other forms of computer-aided design. We still think in terms of x, y, and z. But Gauss thought, do we really need that extra space? Do we, need, do we really need that shoebox in which we put this two-dimensional shape? Cannot we study two-dimensional shape ex ex strictly with local information? And the answer he came up with was yes. So he took, um, he took the coordinates out completely and he said, well, that point, the point that we, we, we used to identify with x, y, and z coordinates, can now be defined via the differential calculus. Remember, as I just said, the differential calculus is sort of about rates of change, the rate of change of position with respect to time, that is speed, which is an intensive property. But it can also be the rate of change like that you're building a dam and you need to know how much, you know, you know that the pressure on the dam is going to be higher, the deeper into the lake or whatever your damming is, so you're going to have to have a thicker concrete wall or, or more, a stronger base at the bottom, but you want, to, you want to know at what rate is pressure changing relative to depth. In other words, time doesn't have to come in. It's just a rate of change of one quantity relative to another. What Gauss thought was, in the two-dimensional case, which is the one he tackled, each one of those points can be characterized by the rate of change of curvature at that point. Let me just show it in cross-section and let's take a nipple-shaped, Greenlinish kind of shape in cross-section. As you can see, curvature is not changing at all here, so it's zero. Then it begins picking up speed, changes direction, slows down a little, picks up speed again up to this point, slows down a little, but then picks up speed again until it becomes zero again. In other words, with the treatment that Gauss gave, each one of those points becomes a rate of change of curvature and the entire plane, instead of being a collection of X, Y, and Z addresses, becomes a field of rapidities and slownesses. The rapidity or slowness with which curvature is changing at that particular point. And that thought changed geometry forever. Because all of a sudden, you didn't have to have an absolute space in which your local spaces are inscribed and that serves as, a, as an absolute frame of reference. You could investigate spaces locally and the, and the, and the changes of curvature locally. Gauss solved the two-dimensional, the 2D case. Riemann, his disciple, was expected to solve the 3D case. That's, what, that's how you go, you know, your, your teacher solved the 2D case, you solved the 3D case. But Riemann was cocky. He wanted the whole enchilada. So he went for the n-dimensional case and solved it. An n-dimensional space defined in terms of rapidities and slownesses is called a manifold or a multiplicity. And it's an entirely different, and it, it becomes the basis for an entirely different philosophy of space. Topology is simply a generalization or a more abstract form of differential geometry. But it's also based on the same idea, infinitesimal rapidities and slownesses defining the points that make a space. Einstein, seven years after Riemann had already solved the problem, was the first one who saw, I mean, this, became, this was, of course, an obscurity in mathematical circles, and only mathematicians thought about it, despite the fact that everybody can see it's pregnant with importance, it's pregnant with significance. Einstein, to his credit, was the first one who saw how this applies to the universe. Prior to him, in Newtonian 
classical mechanics, you needed an absolute space to which that served as a reference, a fixed reference point for any ascription of position for any particular body or for any particular planet or whatever you were studying in astronomy. Einstein realized that by switching to differential geometry, he could, by, by using manifolds, he could now study space strictly in local terms and see how gravity, or the gravity of our sun would curve or give a certain amount of curvature to the space around it and you did not need to, to, to think about absolute space in order to see that. You could calculate it and calculate the difference that it would make if you took a photograph. Let me just draw it here very fast. Basically, what, he's, what he thought is, well, if this is, the, if this is the Earth and this is the Sun, and these are two stars that we know their distance because we can measure them when the sun is not there when they, you know when they are say over here relative to us when they are behind the sun they should curve a little bit so to speak and I'm exaggerating here the, to make my point so that a photograph taking of the stars when there's no sun should show a certain difference in the distance between the stars when there is a sun. Problem is, you cannot take a picture of the stars when the sun is there because the sun is hiding them. So in 1919, and of course he made the calculation and made a very specific prediction as to how far, as to how the, 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 the difference between the two measurements should be. In 1919 there was a solar eclipse that allow for the first time to hide the sun while revealing those two stars. Most scientific societies of the world sent uh, teams of scientists to take photographs with lots of precision instruments to different parts of the world where the eclipse would, could be best viewed. They took the photographs, they measured the distance, they came out to within a few millimeters of what Einstein had, pred Einstein had predicted and Einstein became of course a superstar. But he would, uh, he would not have become a superstar was it not for Riemann. Because it was Riemann who created, well, following Gauss, who created, the, who broke with metric geometry to start thinking non-metrically. Now, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to finish this and wrap this up. How do this relate to the other two things that we were talking about? I mean, how do these this three reasoning styles relate to one another? Well, think again of population thinking, and think again of evolution as a search process, and think again of what I said, that most sculptors and architects who have used, and musicians who have used a genetic algorithm to breed art, to breed form, seem to run out of forms relatively fast. In other words, the search space the space that the algorithm searches doesn't have enough richness. And what this has brought to the fore is the fact that the spaces themselves need to be thought. The algorithm is going to do the search, but someone needs to think about the spaces, the spaces of possibilities. Now, these spaces cannot be metric because in evolution, all metric relationships are changeable. For instance, the, the, the space of vertebrates or the space of mammals cannot contain a certain length for a neck because giraffes have very, very long necks, rhinoceros and, and certain people I know have no neck at all. In other words, they can stretch, it's a variable length. Therefore, the only thing that can be specified about that abstract vertebrate, what is called the phylum chordata, is its topology. That is, or you can only use topological invariance to describe the abstract vertebrate, such as connectivity, the singularities that may or may not populate that particular space. And so, in order to think about search spaces, you need to drop metricity. You may need to return to metric because, of course, we live in a metric world. 
And in this particular world, just like it's ex extensive properties dominate the, 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 the continents that we inhabit, for most practical purposes, most of the buildings and so on that we built have to be metric. So you may have to end up with a metric space, but in the design process, and prior to the coagulation of your design, prior to its final territorialization, you may want to keep those spaces non-metric. Secondly, intensive thinking and topological thinking relate in the following way. You can assign to each one of these dimensions a particular intensive quantity, say temperature to one, and pressure to the other dimension. This can of course vary, it can be three-dimensional spaces, four-dimensional spaces, and the intensive quantities can be entirely different. But let's stick to the simple example. Now, that space of points, that space of rapidities and slownesses, has now become a space of possibilities, a space of possible states for a particular system to be in, the space of possible combinations of temperature and pressure. And in this case, what you want to find out is that the topological invariants include not only connectivity, but also dimensionality. If, a, if the space is two-dimensional, it doesn't matter how you fold it and stretch it and fold it again, it cannot become more than two dimensions. The third topological invariant is singularities. And singularities are special points in a manifold to which trajectories become attracted. They're also called, for the same reason, attractors. Let's go back to Fry Otto. Fry Otto, without knowing about this, knew from experience that the population of molecules in the, in the soap film becomes attracted to a minimum of energy. So if one of those two dimensions was surface tension, there would be a singularity, a minimum, in that space, which is monopolizing the space of possibilities, or being the most important, most relevant point. Remember the word singular has two meanings, going back to the meanings, meanings. One is singular versus plural, that's not the one I'm talking about here. The other one is singular versus ordinary. Singular means remarkable, special. Singularities in manifolds, or what this now is called phase space, once you assigned particular intensive properties to as values for those coordinates. Singularities give you the, the, the local destinies, the, the necessary outcomes, but local, for a particular process happening in that space of possibilities. Some spaces of possibilities have only one singularity, a minimum. Those are soap, so that means soap film, crystals, you know, the cube, cubic form. By minimizing bonding energy, the folded proteins that acquire a particular three-dimensional en enzyme form are also formed by minimizing energy. But there are many other types of singularities, not only steady state, which were once the ones that were steady state singularities were already known by the 18th century. They were discovered by another great mathematician. Leonard Euler, who invented the calculus of variations, the first piece of software that you could feed it differential equations on one side and would, would spew out as output on the other side the singularities, the maxima, the minima, the inflection points. Then by the 1930s, periodic singularities were discovered. Those force trajectories in the space of possibilities to wrap, they have the form of a loop, of a closed topological loop, and each trajectory will wrap itself around and be forced to pulsate a radio transmitter, and in fact it was radio transmitters that Van der Paul was studying when he discovered the singularities. A radio transmitter, when you turn it on, particularly the analog vacuum tube based uh, 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 transmitters that were in use in the 30s goes through what engineers call transients, a little period of relatively erratic behavior and then it gets, get trap, gets trapped by the attractor and begins pulsating and emitting at a perfect rhythm spherical waves of electromagnetic radiation. 
we can then on that signal, on those, elect on those constantly produced waves of electromagnetic radiation, modulate the amplitude and get F a, 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 a AM radio or modulate the frequency and get FM radio. Is we can superimpose a pattern by modulation, but the thing needs to pulsate stably before we can impose any pattern on it. In other words, a radio transmitter needs to have a periodic singularity, a periodic attractor. Finally, in the 1960s, the badly misnamed chaotic attractors were discovered. Those are relatively quasi-periodic singularities whose, uh, whose uh, dynamics are much more complicated. They have nothing chaotic about them because they also restrict the space of possibilities to, in other words, they make a certain space much more, a certain part of the space much more uh, uh, important. We will be getting back to this. Another name for that is, I mean, fractal, strange attractors, and so on. Their repertoire of singularities is growing. For us, and just to conclude this session, what this is very important, what, the reason why this is important is because they provide us with the, a, a, a repertoire of means of structuring spaces of possibilities. And when we are using something like genetic algorithms or genetic programming, the search space needs to have structure. And that structure needs to be specified in terms of topological invariance. And of course, the, the dimensions of that space need to be intensive. So as you can see, and I'm not saying that I completely explained this, but I'm showing you at least the tip of the iceberg, Deleuze saw differences in each one of these planetary styles, saw the centrality of the concept of difference genetic differences, intensive differences, differential relations, and then weave them together into a new form of realism, a new form of way of, a new, a new way of specifying in what sense exactly the world is independently of our minds and matter and energy have morphogenetic capabilities independently of us. And, and it is precisely that independence from our mind that makes them worthwhile partners for us as designers. It is precisely because they display this spontaneous creative behavior that we can meet them halfway and make them our partners in the, in the design process. Thank you very much. you the microphone so that everybody can hear. Is this going to be a long question based on comparison and it goes, I hope, hopefully to the core of your argument that somehow technoscience can be independent of the mind, which I'm not sure if I agree on uh, with you. But you and I'm going to go to the core of your argument where you talked about, oh, oh by the way, Riemann's experiment proving Einstein was also important for another guy, Eric Mendelssohn. So that's important for this room. Um, your core of your argument where you said uh, that, that bodies without organs represent intensive thresholds within the productivity of technoscience. Um, and that's my term. And I'm I want to compare that to Zizek, who argues that bodies without organs are the same things as organ without bodies. In other words, uh, and he, he uses the term organ meaning in the political sense, a politicus organ, meaning a political ideology which becomes then a self-serving productive logic. In other words, an idiomatic self-serving machine. So there are two different interpretations of the same thing. One presumes, in your case, the absolute need for technoscience, where the other presumes, in the case of Zizek, um, the need for pure meaning, or what we might call pure significance. And, and one, uh, well, well, pure significance and pure meaning uh, are uh, virtually the same thing. Right, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of Zizak here. Uh, right, Zizak. Um, so what I'm, what I'm curious about is if, if you're concluding then that essentially that, um, that Deleuze is a techno-scientist, or if he's 
a philosopher. And the question I had was your exclusivity of intensities within systems of productivity. In other words, um, could we not speak of as an atom or myself sitting in a, in a station, a point of, st of stationary non-movement as existing within an in intensity? In other words, I sit quietly. Can I not be intense and, and have a, a moment of significance? Um, so, in other words, um, which goes back then to my original question, whether uh, technoscience is indeed, um, uh, what was my original statement? That technoscience, go ahead. <laughs> I understand exactly what you're saying. Number one, the word technoscience was invented, if I'm not mistaken, by Bruno Latour, right? Bruno Latour, who is, of course, a critic of science. Now, the problem with that, is that who is going to believe that ethnologists and sociologists can actually debunk physics, chemistry, and biology? I would like to know that. Once, you know, what means the, 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 those, the, those kinds of human sciences have in order to debunk the entire work of hundreds of physicists, chemists, and biologists for three or four centuries? I find it impossible. In fact, when I read Latour going into that laboratory with Gulgar, you know, to study uh, macrobiologists doing their thing. It seems like as if two behaviorist psychologists have gone in there, rule out, because there are behaviors, any kind of content inside, you know, expertise. proved as far as they are concerned. In other words, they are idealists who don't believe in the mind independence of the world, who go into the laboratory to prove that. The question now is, why would they bother going into the laboratory? If things are not mind independent, then in what way is your observations of what's going on in the laboratory going to constitute evidence for what you're saying? This is called self-referential incoherence. If you come up with a theory, if you come up with a theory that when applied to yourself makes your own statements false, you are being self-referential incoherent. Most science studies people are self-referential incoherent. Now, going back to Zizek. Zizek is a Lacanian. Lacanians, of course, do not believe in the mind independence of the world since they talk about their symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. By the time they get to the real, it's like, it's like the little piece of garbage that is like, who cares? You know, it's like the symbolic, uh, uh, the imaginary, uh, the real. Ooh. So in other words, they also assume from the start that the real is a construction of either the symbolic or the imaginary. Now what Deleuze did, I mean, remember that the very first book of Deleuze is a book on Hume. Not on Hume the, the positivist, so to speak, the one who said, you know, a, 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 a all knowledge can be legitimately based only on sense data, on a direct experience. What he took from Hume was a completely different thing. He took from Hume a completely different concept of subjectivity, which is very, very different than Lacan and than Freud, which is basically this. Hume said, when we're born, before your subject crystallizes, so to speak, because your personality acquires, becomes territorialized, we live in a delirium of pure intensities, intensities of color, intensities of sound, intensities of smell, intensities of texture, which have in a, in a kind of unstructured delirium. Then habit, the day-to-day -day habitual association of resem by resemblance, by contiguity, by cause and effect, it starts establishing links between those those sensations, those intensities, and now all of a sudden those intensities become my intensities. The colors I see, the sounds I hear, the smells I smell. But the moment you have a fever of 106 degrees, or you go into a sensory isolation chamber, or you have too many uh, psychedelic drugs, or you go mad, 
those sensations acquire their own independence. You rediscover the fact that they were not your sensations, that they were free intensities out of which you crystallized in a kind of phase transition. Now, what, the reason this is important is because, again, if we begin with a theory of subjectivity, which is Kantian, in which subjectivity emerges in a process of categorization by assigning things to categories, whether transcendental or arbitrary Saussurian signifiers, then you already decided from the beginning what the conclusion is going to be. Again, it's a kind of self-referential incoherence, because then you can ask, well, how would you know that? if you cannot have any independent evidence for it. Now we can, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to let somebody else ask a question, but you, you see my point though, right? I mean, these people begin, okay, I'm gonna give you the microphone just for like five seconds. Here you go. My question wasn't doubting the independence of the material. My question was that you can't divorce techno science from it. this way. The problem with the word techno-science to begin with, and the whole little culture that has uh, developed around it, is this. They analyze scientific I totally agree with you that science is a social process. And being a social process is not independent of our minds. Period. Perfect. The problem with it is this. What the, te what the techno-science crowd does is they focus on particular controversies. Let's say Lavoisier versus You know, the, 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 the uh, Hobbes controversy in England, they focus on those controversies. And when you focus on the controversy between Lavoisier and Priestley, say, to take an example, they're ugly. They're ugly. They call each other names. They go for allies. You know, Lavoisier got his French allies versus Priestley that got his British allies. And the French went for the French, and the British went for the British. More social, the whole thing couldn't possibly be, right? I mean, it, it's obvious that it was a social process through which the decision was reached. However, by concentrating on the pure controversy between two minds, what they leave out is the collective process of searching in a search space that took over 50 or 60 years around that tiny controversy, which involved more than 20 or 30 different scientists, none of whom had a complete view of the space. And when you read it at longer time scales, you see that in fact, between those 20 or 30 scientists, they did search the entire space, finding dead ends here, dead ends there, until at the end, when they sided with Lavoisier, it was not for social reasons. It was for the fact that over 50 years of experiments had little by little pointed to just one way out. And therefore, and then, of course, oxygen was declared the winner. The problem with the techno-science crowd is that they do not take the right time scales. It is correct to study science in a social context. I completely agree with you. Because science is a social process. The question is, the objectivity of science, how is that achieved? Is it achieved because rational individual minds see truths? Or is it achieved because 20, 30, 40, 50 science over several decades collectively explore a space and eventually reach a very hard to reach conclusion at the end. You, it is my belief that it is the second one, and that that is how science has produced subjectivity. Now, on the other hand, and they, I'm, here I'm going to agree with you, society or social factors can narrow, can narrow the focus of science and invest the resources of sciences on the fields that happen to be more prestigious at the time. So for instance, astronomy, which was, of course, ever since the first guy predicted an eclipse and, and some despotic king took advantage of it to, 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 to gain prestige and legitimacy. Oh, I'm going to predict that the sun is going to be clear. Oh, everybody going like that. Astronomy has been a royal science, as Deleuze calls it, ever since its beginning. So when you look at science in the 17th and 18th centuries, astronomy and classical physics got most of the money and most of the resources. 
sciences are just material science, say metallurgy, didn't develop until the 20th century, despite the fact that they are extremely important, perhaps much more important to us than astronomy is. And yet they were considered minor scientists. They were considered scientists that did not deserve the prestige, they did not deserve the legitimacy, they did not deserve the resources. So what society does is not to affect the objectivity of science, but to affect this focus by narrowing it, and to affect what fields get developed or become underdeveloped in any given period of time, because science is expensive. Science needs money, and that money gets channeled to particular views. In the case that we're talking about here, steady state attractors were discovered first, and then all of a sudden, because the scientists that discovered them were the most prestigious, everybody began thinking, well, everything is like a soap bubble. Everything has survival of the fittest, or demand and supply cancel each other out at the exact point, or everybody began thinking that all search spaces have a single optimum and are structured simply. That is pure ideology. And that affected the objectivity of science, definitely. It took a bunch of minor scientists in the 30s and in the 60s, the one that I just mentioned, Lawrence and Van der Paul, two guys that most people haven't heard of, to begin opening up science to new adventures, to new possibilities, because he had become narrowed down by a strictly social uh, question. So I completely agree with you that the social aspects of scientific practice need to be explored in detail, the role of institutions and organizations, the role those organizations have with the state, uh, uh, where the resources come from, who monopolizes prestige and legitimacy and so on, but they need to be studied at the right time scales and at the right spatial scales. And this techno-science crowd, unfortunately, is studying things too ethnologically, too narrowly, giving us a false picture of the, si of the social factors that affect science. Yes. Yes. Now I do feel like that. What's his name? There you go. Um, I'm interested in the implications that uh, Deleuzean philosophy might have on environmentalism and whether or not it's coincidental or purely semantic that both uh, rely on the ecological to uh, develop certain arguments, or whether or not you can trace a uh, lineage? Besides writing a book on Hume, another one of the early books of Deleuze was on a post-Renaissance 17th century philosopher called Spinoza. Spinoza, who was kicked out of the Jewish community in Amsterdam for basically saying what I'm saying, you know, I read the, the excommunication, you know, may the seven angels of the seven days of the week curse you, may the 12 angels of the 12 months of the year curse you. You know, I'm reading this and I'm going, I gotta get myself one of these, man. I mean, what do you have to do today to be excommunicated in style? <laughs> but the main reason why he got kicked out is because he, dif he distinguished very sharply between morality and ethics. Morality is about good and evil as essences. Incarnate in the devil and God, incarnate in Darth Vader and, 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 and Luke Skywalker, what, 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 whatever you want. Or, you know, Bush and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. Ethics is about mixtures, assemblages. What kinds of assemblages increase the power, increase the capacities to affect and be affected of the things involved, and which assemblages decrease that power. To use a, 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 an environmental example, I mean, the difference between this is this. Whereas morality is about absolutes, good and evil, the other one is about thresholds, intensive thresholds. For instance, we know that phosphorus, which is a nutrient, nourishes the soil. In other words, when you add phosphorus to the soil, the, the, the assemblage that results has more power, more power to sustain life, but only up to a certain point. Beyond a threshold, in a process called eutrification, which typically happens when you add too much fertilizer, the fertilizer gets washed out, down the river some other farmer gets all your extra phosphorus, it poisons the soil. So nourishment versus poison. 
mixtures that nourish, that enhance, that make for a, a, a more complex entity, an entity with more capacities, versus mixtures that degrade, that poison, that destroy. Because that difference cannot be established absolutely, not even in the case of soils, because soils have different grain sizes, different percolation properties, and so you have to actually empirically establish where the threshold is going to be. That was terrible for those who excommunicated Spinoza, because he was basically saying morality is experimental. I mean, ethics is experimental. You cannot have, you cannot have absolutes, and particularly absolutes, based on the meanings of words and hermeneutics and reading, interpreting sacred texts. You need to go out in the field, I, 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 interact with the materiality of the world, see what mixtures enhance, see what mixtures degrade. Now, the same thing can be applied to relationships. Everybody knows couples who bring the best out of one another, and you want them in your party. And you know, everybody knows people who bring the worst out of one another. You know, you forgot the one, you bitch. No, I told you, you know. And everybody wants them out of their parties because they poison the air. They're organizations whose very existence, by the very size that they have, that allow them to blackmail the government. I'm going to close a plant that's 300,000 employees if you don't give me a tax break. They can get away with pollution for, for, for decades until someone else pays for it, that indeed are bad in a Spinozian sense, and there are other systems of organizing economics that are nourishing. But again, they, there's no absolutes. You need to experiment to find out. And so, to answer the question more briefly then, is that the second book of the list was precisely about that, the difference between ethics and morality. And to try to establish that ethics is a matter of interacting with materiality until, and to discover this mutually enhancing holes and to avoid mutually degrading ones. Yes? Sir, sort of. Yes. But I mean, so your voice is being recorded, so we might as well. The relation, I guess, of um, Deleuze to Lacan and later Lacan and topology, is there any, and in relation to this where you said that Lacanians just kind of ignore the real. Because we don't know to what extent Lacan actually understood topology. I understand that he talked about the Borromean knot and that knot theory is definitely a branch of topology. But it is, whereas in the case of Deleuze, topology plays a very clear role in defining these possibility spaces, what he calls the virtual, not the, not, this, not the possibilities themselves, the structure of the space of possibilities, the dimensions, the singularities, that is the topological invariance. Whereas in the case of Deleuze, and, and this is a long French tradition going back to Poincaré, Poincaré is the one who invented phase space, the one who first put together topological thinking with intensive thinking, and there is a clear, you know, Poincaré left several French uh, uh, disciples whose books unfortunately have not been translated into English, which is why American and, and English analytical philosophers just discovered face space like a, 10 years ago. Deleuze was surrounded by disciples of Poincaré. I and mean, you read books by disciples of Poincaré. He did not use topology as a source of vague metaphors. He used topology in a way that it is intrinsic and indispensable in his definition of the virtual or the, the world of structure, of structures of space of possibilities. Uh, Lacan was a very intelligent person, but again, if you begin as an idealist, if you begin thinking that, to put it a different way, Eskimos see 29 kinds of snow because they have 29 words for snow, as opposed to Eskimos have 29 words for snow because they touch, they walk, they build igloos with, and here I'm stereotyping poor Eskimos like crazy, because they interact and causally intervene in a world of 29 kinds of snow, mixtures of the solid and liquid state. That's why they have 29 words for snow. The non-linguistic practices are more important and more varied than the linguistic ones. And so, Lacan made the choice of saying they, have, they see the 29 kinds of snow because they have the words, whereas the loose from the beginning sided with no, they have 29 words, 
because snow is so important in all their activities that synonyms begin accumulating when something is very, very important and synonyms tend to disappear from a vocabulary unless they acquire subtle shades of meaning and they begin to referring to different, to different types. In other words, the non-linguistic, the inter causal interventions in reality and in, the, in this case the reality of snow is what gives rise over time to the words not the words giving rise to the reality. Yes? My question is a little bit more uh, personal and perhaps far simpler. Um, and it has to do with your, your personal relationship with architecture as a place to, to, to put your specific practice which seems to be the product of a very interdisciplinary uh, set of uh, origins with something that I mean I, I don't know how to ask it without being over generalizing uh, but it okay it seems there seems to be some intensive triggers you know that maybe you could talk a little bit more well I mean there's two answers to the question one is that uh, there's a, cer a certain accidental aspect to it and there's another one that makes much more sense the one that makes more and more sense is this. If I had to choose of all the different artists, of all the design fields out there, who I would want to teach to, sculptors, painters, musicians, and so on, I would choose architects. The reason why is because architects, whether they want it or not, need to deal with materiality. They need to deal with gravity. They need to deal with load-bearing structures. They need to deal with the fact that they are building stuff out of dynamite. Every column, every beam that is under stress, that is actually bearing a load, is, is storing strain energy enough to explode, if you're careless enough, to, let, to design that column in such a way that can actually explode. Now, artists who build with explosives, that's my kind of artist. He's someone who is, has a certain commitment beyond just superficial words. There is, a, there is the energy right there. So, despite the fact that you also need to talk about design and aesthetics and belonging to a tradition where there's modernist, postmodernist, and so on, and, it, we, and, and you need to deal with all kinds of other, or, other things such as what we might call affordances, the opportunities and risks that the particular organization of space affords or supplies the user of that space, the privacy that enclosed space affords you, the visibility or the expansive experience that a more open space affords you or supplies you with, you, you have to keep, to keep one foot on materiality and the other one on things that are perhaps less material but equally important. The more accidental part has to do with this. I didn't really choose to teach architects. They picked me and at first I was, I did not understand why and then I understood why. The reason why was that a lot of architects were reading Berilio, who is of course an architect and who wrote on bunker archaeology, on the architecture of bunkers. But Virilio is a big admirer of Sun Tzu, The Art of War, which is of course a very thin book filled with uh, pearls of wisdom, and he writes with pearls of wisdom, right? I mean, you've seen Speed and Politics and the other books. There's no references. If you, if you want to study more about military architecture, uh, about, and, and, and he throws in a bunch of uh, terms like the glazes, you know, the, which is part of uh, you know, military architecture in terms of the kind of uh, the way you approach the, 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 the fortress and so on. And architects towards the end of the, uh, the 80s were hungry to, know, to kind of go beyond Borrelio, but in, the, in a Borrelian direction. Because Borrelio, of course, despite the fact that later on he became more of an idealist, at the beginning was very much of a materialist. He was talking about real speed and real tanks going over architecture and flattening spaces and so on. So when my book, War in the Age of Intelligent Machines, came out, very much inspired by Virilio, you know, I, 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 I say so in the book, but what I discovered is that there were all kinds of other military theorists who, who knew, in fact, quite a bit more than Virilio did, uh, and gave all those references so that people who really wanted to know about military architecture or indeed about speed and politics in general could now continue the research. In other words, my book was kind of brilliant without Sun Tzu, you know, without that kind of pearl of wisdom approach to the thing, more methodical with all the references. And I believe that is what 
moved the first generation of architects that liked my work to, to get into my work and then to give me the opportunity to teach architects. After that, I stayed because it's my favorite crowd as far as artists are concerned. You know, again, as I said, you cannot, and, and the, uh, that's why I began today's talk with Fry Otto. It is the, it, it is the crowd that, that you can convince, it's, it's easier to convince that there's something going on here in soap film. There's something going on in materiality. Because you guys have a tradition of that, that I can exploit. And so, little by little, it just, it just became like a, like a match made in heaven. Yes. Yeah. One more. Just one more. A little one. Yeah? Do I have a question over there? Okay, guys. Well, yes. Finally. Shy crowd. Thank you. It's actually a, kind of a simple question, but um, uh, is there a relationship between uh, war and peace and intensity and equilibrium in the context of what we talked about? The real war. <laughs> And they, I didn't answer that question, but the, the answer is, of course, yes. Absolute zero of temperature is an intensity, the fact that it's an absolute zero. As you approach that absolute zero, things become superconductors all of a sudden. The moment you approach that absolute zero, magical things, helium begins kind of flowing out of its container and, and doing crazy things. And it, it, taking a rest between rapid episodes in your life can be, in fact, a way of handling intensities, of manipulating intensities. So it's not only about rapidity, but also slownesses, well-chosen slownesses. So in this particular case, you know, war is of course all about very, very high intensities, very, very high intensity explosives, very, very high intensity of density of masses in the armies, very high intensity of discipline and drill very high intensity of esprit de corps. And so the question is whether there are in fact, w whether in fact we need to inhabit intermediate zones of intensity, whether, whether certain intensities are too low and fix us in steady state behavior, but whether certain intensities are too high and become turbulent to the point where we cannot have any, any choices or any decisions in what, we, in what we do. Life itself, biological life, in fact, inhabits an intermediate zone of intensity. Our planet is not Venus or Mars, or is not Venus or Mercury that are too hot, but it's not Mars that is too cold. It's in an intermediate zone of intensity. So the question here, again, if we talk about ethics and not morality, then there's a moral way of approaching peace and war. War is evil. Peace is good. There is then the ethical question of how much intensity can we take and continue functioning? How, what kind of role should the military play in unleashing these intensities? If you think of, for instance, World War I, in which the plan of the Germans had been, had been war-gamed to the death by Schlieffen and other generals towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, and they thought they had the perfect plan to outflank Fr the French and inv invade France, and the war was going to end in a few days, and in a kind of relatively low-intensity warfare. But by planning it so rigidly, and by, by believing that, by kind of underestimating the role that the enemy has in, in conflicting with your plans, they took away all the decision-making power by politicians of the time, to the point that when that assassination took place that triggered the beginning of the war, politicians almost had no decision-making room to maneuver. That is, there was no room for diplomacy left. War became inevitable. And all of a sudden, this turbulence was unleashed, 
everybody remembered at the time the very last war that they had, they had fought, which was the 1870-71 Franco-Prussian War, which was over in a few days and, and was very high tech with uh, railroads and telegraphs, you know, allowing the coordination of the troops and so on. Nobody expected that the turbulence unleashed by that assassination was going to end in the largest siege warfare, the trench warfare, that resulted, the horrendous uh, turbulence that resulted, that was of course completely unethical in a Spinozian terms. And once it happened, the generals were like, you know, back in their castles drinking Chateau Latour and, 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 and fine wine and telephoning, you know, finding the telephone, oh, virtual reality, look at this embodied voice, how cute telephoning their orders to the front. Now, those mismatches of intensity, those, those degrading mixtures of intensity are clearly a bad thing. And that is one of the things that war is always bad, but it's not nearly as bad as when, when it's fought by weakened warriors. We have the Iraq war, of course, to remind us of that right now. So the point is that it's not a matter of making judgments about low or high intensity. It's a matter of, in concrete cases, always discovering those limits of intensity beyond which you are, in fact, degrading not only yourself, but the lives of your troops and the lives of all those citizens caught in that, in that warfare. Below a certain degree of intensity, things might be bearable and even might result in some constructive outcome in which the, in which the powers that went to war can act went to work and actually negotiate peace in relatively favorable terms instead of unleashing a series of catastrophic events that nobody now can control and nobody can now maneuver around. So, so it